I am excited and honored to welcome Dr. M. Sanjan. Hi guys, hi everyone. Uh, thanks so much um, for inviting me here today. Uh, Scott asked me almost a year ago to, to come out here um, and I'm so thrilled that uh, Calendus worked out and I managed to make it out here because to be honest in what I do today, even though my background is in science and you know, I, I went to graduate school and did, did sort of all of that. And um, I don't really get to meet the people who are really on the front lines of conservation. And, um, you know, the more time I spend in, in, in meetings or with donors or on television, you just are so many steps removed from really what happens on the ground and what you see on the ground. And uh, I actually really, really, really enjoyed um, I wanted to cede some of my time for the, to continue the tour of Arkansas because I, I didn't know. Um, and and from, the, from the gasp from the audience, they didn't know either. And I, I wanted to find out, you know, what happened to that 15-foot alligator and all of those other cool stories. Um, so really, thank you for having me out here. Really, it really is a pleasure. Um, I don't work much in the United States anymore. I did it one time. I used to be at the Nature Conservancy, as the lead science of the Conservancy, and at one point ran the science and conservation programs for the Nature Conservancy in California. And so obviously had experience doing that. But my work now is really global. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, be, given that you are going to get a lot of content over the next few days, um, in everything from strategy to messaging to everything else uh, and, and really getting into the practicalities uh, and the details of your work. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about kind of the big picture as I see it um, and very respectfully saying that because I think all of you have your own opinions and uh, you know um, and they're all equally valid. When what I really want to focus on today is on how we message things because I think at the end of the day, most of the work that we are doing on the ground, whether you're working in a preserve in, um, in the Midwest or whether you're working on, car on, on island nations in the middle of the Pacific, I think the work itself is pretty fundamental. And when Scott Simons went through you know, sort of the basic things to think about when you think about collaboration and partnerships, I mean, I, I completely agreed with those. I mean, that's exactly the same thing we do. But I think the way we talk about our work could be very, very different. And I want to give you a little sense of how I talk about it and how we talk about it at Conservation International and, frankly, how many international conservation organizations speak about the work we do and why it might resonate and why it might draw the audience that we absolutely need on our side if we're going to try to uh, accomplish the mission that is in front of us. So that's really what my talk is really about. It's about, about messaging. And then hopefully if we have time, I'll end with a two minute uh, short video that I, I wanted to show you. So I spoke to some students today. Um, uh, I was looking for coffee and I ran into them and, and I started talking to them about it and I was like, give me some ideas about what to talk about because I've got nothing. Um, <laughs> and they're like, who are you? And I was like, okay. <laughs> um, why are you standing here? Uh, uh, so I have to introduce myself. Um, but you know, one of the things they said is, so tell us about how you got to do what you did. And I'm not going to do that because that's, you know, there's, it's, not, it's sort of almost pointless to know that because it doesn't actually really help you. Each person has their own path there. But I will tell you something about how I got started in sort of conservation. So when I I grew up abroad. I, I was born in Sri Lanka. I grew up in Africa. All my experiences really in Africa, um, West and East Africa. And I came to the United States for college and then graduate school. And in graduate school, um, I went to UC Santa Cruz and I went to work with a guy named Michael Soule. And at that time, Soule had written this pretty incredible book, uh, edited this pretty incredible book, which had the words conservation biology. And it's the first time anyone, did, anyone to me anyway, had used those words. It put conservation biology um, up there in this book. And um, so I went to work with him, and I really wanted to go work on cheetahs in Africa. And that sort of made sense, right? Um, I, you know, I've grown up in Africa, and I had this vision of like sitting on top of a Land Rover, drinking gin and tonics in the Serengeti, you know, watching cheetahs, and you know, just it was going to be amazing. And um, 
I actually got, I got funding for this. I actually p sort of pulled this off. Um, and I got this incredible grant from USAID um, through the San Diego Zoo to do a big study that was going to support a big study of carnivores in southern Africa, in Namibia in particular. This is a country that had recently uh, come out of apartheid. Um, you know, people were going in there and looking at the carnivores there, and I was going to be part of this group. And this was, I'd done my, you know, sort of defense and all, my, my proposal defense. And then I was in D.C. getting my visa, uh, this research visa, when I got a call. And I got a call from my advisor who says, come back to Santa Cruz. And so I came back to find out that my project had been canceled. Now, this is about two and a half years into my, you know, graduate school. And um, it was canceled. Uh, it was canceled, it turned out, because of pandas, like pandas meaning like the panda bear. Um, and it was, it was because of this. The San Diego Zoo had cut a deal with the Chinese to bring a couple of pandas to the San Diego Zoo. And in return, they were going to give the, the Chinese about $600,000. It was later a million dollars uh, for conservation. But conservation organizations, including the World Wildlife Fund, had put up a stink about this and said that the Chinese were basically going to catch these pandas from the wild and then sell them to American zoos and Western zoos as a money-making scheme. And this is a bad idea. And Bruce Babbitt, uh, who was head of Interior at the time, put a stop to it. And because of this, and this was in the Washington Post, this is in 1993, you can, you can I mean, check this out. And it was a big, big deal. Now, eventually, a, a, I think two years later, Babbitt re reversed his decision. He, he was convinced that the Chinese were actually going to use the money for conservation. Um, and they reversed the decision, and the pandas did come to the San Diego Zoo. But at the time, I was caught up in this, in this incredible power struggle that had nothing to do with me. I'm like one tiny little blip in the universe, and you know, trying to just go have gin and tonics watching cheetahs, um, and paid for by the U.S. government. And I, and it, you know, and I got stopped doing that, right? And it just didn't make any sense. But what happened was that I really quickly had to find a project um, because I was running out of time. And so I looked around, and I ended up doing my project on, on gophers, <laughs> as in the little mammal that digs underground and was on Caddyshack, that, that same gopher. And if you think about this fall, right, one moment you're on the top of the Land Rover, and the next minute you're digging in the earth, you know. And I, was, um, I worked at uh, a, a UC reserve, so the University of California has a big reserve system. It's actually a pretty impressive reserve system because they keep it and use it for long-term monitoring and, and, and field studies, um, and, but a reserve called the Hastings Biological Reserve in, um, in the Central Valley of California. Now, the good thing about working on gophers is that every landowner was like, I've got some of them damn gophers. Come, you know, it sort of became the damn gopher study. Um, and you know, long story short, it actually proved to be a really, really um, fortuitous decision. It actually ended up being a better study. It ended up you know, allowing me to think about storytelling, because now I had to somehow get people who thought I was doing work on cheetahs to still come and listen to my talks, even though I'm now studying gophers. Um, but it made me become very creative about it. So I got my start working, you know, on land, um, under land, um, in California, in a, in a small reserve, and just watching how that reserve was managed for the multiple uses that people had to do, uh, ha had, to, had to use it for. So with that, I'll just sort of get into this, um, and we'll go through this pretty quickly. But does anyone know what this animal is? Of course you do. What is it? It's a rhino. What kind of rhino? It's a white rhino. So it's not just any ordinary white rhino. It's a northern white rhino. And right now, there's only about four of these animals left on the planet. And um, uh, uh, because they're, they're functionally extinct, they're... they're I, I, they're, uh, they're sort of almost beyond breeding age. Um, this one was airlifted from the Czech Zoo into Africa as a chance to try and get it to mate with southern white rhinos and then back cross them and so on and so forth. Um, it's a last, 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 last ditch effort for conservation. But this picture is really incomplete because this picture actually looks like this because in order to keep this rhino safe, you have to have you know 24 hour armed guards because at $60,000 a kilo for rhino horn, there's a real price on this animal's head, okay? 
And so when I go around and talk to people about conservation, most people, and frankly, this is what most people on the planet out there actually think what conservation is about. It's about the last, last thing, and then heroic measures, in this case, literally at the barrel of a gun, protecting it. And it's actually not the work most of us actually do. So I just sort of want to point that out, that, that sort of thing. When you think about climate change today, the poster child of climate change is no longer polar bear, um, which it was a decade ago. Now it's really people. It's really come back home to roost. It's us. This is a picture taken in Bangladesh, a country that will lose about 17% of its land area. It's the most densely populated country in the world, right next door to China and India, and it'll lose 17% of its land area in the next 25 years. Um, and if you go to a place like Uzbekistan, you will have the amazing pleasure of seeing a sea that has disappeared, the fourth largest freshwater lake on the planet. This is the size of one of the Great Lakes. Um, that was around when I was a kid. This would have been 25 meters of water. Uh, today, this lake is actually gone. It's, you know, it's completely gone in Uzbekistan. There's a sliver of it in Kazakhstan. The, the, what's left is so saline that it's hypersaline, so no vertebrates can, can live in it anymore. Once upon a time, it was, this was a trawler that used to ply this water. Again, not like, you know, a thousand years ago. It used to ply the water like when I was a child. And it used to bring in about 10,000 tons of freshwater fish every year. Um, the water for this lake was diverted, the Amur Dair Seridair, for cotton production, and it left that uh, as, a, as a remnant. So we know that the planet is in pretty dire shape. And my question then, the, my opening question is, so why? Why are we in such dire sh shape? There's loads of reasons, from population to consumption to our way of life. But I think part of it also is about how we in the conservation movement have thought about what our role is and what our job is. You know, so I grew up with you know, folks like Ed Abbey you know, as, as, as sort of heroes that I read and thought about. But look at this title of his book, it's Desert Solitaire. It's really about being alone. It's about being on your own. It's a very unusual concept for conservation, if you really think about it. And it's a very Western concept of conservation, to be alone out there in nature, out in the woods. Um, in most other cultures, including my own, it's a social experience. It's not a solitary experience. And if you don't believe me, mo you know, any of you who live in a big... Uh, urban setting. So, you know, I went to school in California. So if you go to San Jose and you go to Alum Rock Park, which is a big state park, it's got mountain lions, it's got bobcats. I've seen loads and loads of cool animals in that park. You go out there and you'll see Hispanic and Asian families mostly. And they're allowed and they are got food and they've got everyone from the grandmother, grandfather, you know, uncles, aunts, kids. It's an incredible social experience. And that's how they perceive nature. And that's sort of their view of, of the world. Um, and then, of course, you have these two books, which are so classic and still, you know, really um, uh, so formative in so many people's minds. You know, E.O. Wilson didn't coin the word, but certainly made it popular and, and introduced us to this concept of biological diversity and, um, you know, the diversity of life. And what did he do? He painted to us for the first time this picture that life, you know, was, was abundant. This was like standing in the Sistine Chapel when you stand in a tropical rainforest and look up at the ceiling. And you're marveling at, you know, life dripping literally from the ceilings. Um, I was recently with, with, with Ed uh, about, about a month ago. And I, I asked him, so I loved, loved these covers of these books, and when I was a kid, I mean, they, they were sort of mesmerizing covers. But obviously I noticed something that was missing from that picture, right? So he, there's no mention of humans on this cover. There's no sign of people, even though we are the biggest influencers of biodiversity and, of course, protectors of biodiversity as well. And I asked him whether he, that was on purpose or whether it was just something he didn't think about. And he actually said to me that it was on purpose. That, that he, he, you know, that, that, that he, the aesthetics of it was beautiful and he wanted to do that. But the, the idea of people, while he understood my point, he didn't feel like, you know, on, on purpose, it was excluded, right? So I think about that a lot. And I think about how we then communicate conservation. And I think we're asking the wrong question. I think we spend a lot of our time asking this question, how can we save nature? 
And that's a wonderful question to ask, and it's what you, all of you, are struggling with, and it's what I am and many of my colleagues struggle with. But I think the question that most people out there in the world want to ask is, can nature save us? And I'm wondering that if we could change our dialogue a little bit and come at it a different way, whether it wouldn't actually bring more people to our tent and big, make us, rather than a niche, a real movement, a real, uh, you know, give us the real ability to communicate pe with people who are very, very different from us, who may not get so much pleasure from wanting to hear the story about what happened with the 15-foot alligator in an Arkansas swamp. Right? Come out into nature, it might kill you. It's just not such a great tagline, it turns out. It works for us, right? It works for us. I live in Montana because I like living in Montana, knowing that when I go for a walk in the woods, there is something bigger out there. There is something more heroic out there, something that puts me in my place, something that has no reverence for me that can actually come out and take my head off. That's kind of cool for me. Doesn't kind of work for a lot of people. So I want to just talk about five key points, or maybe six key points, and I'll do this very quickly. You've heard this all before, but we'll whip through these. First point I want to make is that companies, for the most part, work in their rational best self-interest, right? And the cheaters always out there, and exceptions aside, companies are generally rational. And that rationality is actually a useful thing. So what you could do with that is you could take something like saving tropical rainforests, for example, and convert that into a reason why a company ought to care. Because, not because it's necessarily a good thing to do. That's fine, and companies want credit for good things they do. But much more importantly, because it actually makes a difference to their model to their notion of sustainability, to, to their notion of where they're going to get the raw materials they, they get. A guy at General Mills told me um, a couple of years ago that for his, the way he thinks about it, sustainability equals availability. So when he thinks about sustainability, he really thinks about where does my water come from? You know, where does the soil come from? Where does land for growing food come from? Where does uh, shade for coffee come from? And so, you know, that's something that lots of conservation organizations have done a lot with. And my org, Conservation International, certainly has done a lot on, in this area. So, for example, with Starbucks, we have this incredible partnership with Starbucks. You wouldn't... <laughs> That's a little bit too much. <laughs> That's quite funny. I, I don't mean to promote... I'm not getting a cut from Starbucks right now. That's quite, I just, but many of you are in line, too. Um, so... If you go to Starbucks and you take a bag of coffee from their shelf and you look at the back, you'll see our organization's logo on it. And that logo basically signifies that every ounce of Starbucks coffee today, this is actually quite amazing, it's 395 million pounds of coffee a year, is sustainable. When we started with them 15 years ago, it was about 10% of their supply chain. Today we've moved Starbucks to 100%. They like to call it 99% because they are like saying we're always kind of making it better. But basically 100% of their coffee is grown under a practice called cafe practices, which ensures some level of sustainability. Is it enough? No. But it's pretty damn good. So one of the things that they do, for example, so that means a million farmers around the world participate in this program, right? And these farmers, I'll give you a couple of things of what makes that standard that standard. They cannot cut down a tree in order to grow coffee. It's zero tolerance. So if you're a farmer, and there's a million farmers you've got to monitor around the world, you cut a tree down and you're out of the program. Um, another thing they have to do is they have to send their kids to school. If, if there's a school available and you have school-age kids, you've got to send your kids to school. It's a zero tolerance um, uh, li limit for it. And then there's also pollution and water and all these other things as well. But it's a pretty incredible thing for a company as big as Starbucks to really get into that game. And they're doing it because, yeah, they want to be good global citizens and they want a story to tell, but they're doing it because they really worry about their supply chain, about shade, about how they grow their coffee, and how their farmers participate in their program. For me, companies in that instance are incredible allies to the work we do because they do sort of get that notion that nature can save their business rather than the other way around. Again, not all companies, but it does make sense. 
The second uh, point I want to make is that cities are a really great godsend to conservation. Because cities, it turns out, are a concentration of wealth and a concentration of needs. You know, when you go into a city, it's pretty easy to figure out where your supply comes from and where your output, your pollution, your waste goes into. And you, can, you have a framework, you have something that you can actually work with and work around. And it turns out that lots of cities around the world really have embraced this notion of conservation in one form or another. The classic example is New York City, of course, with many, many natural areas protected around New York City because of water. But it doesn't just work in the United States. So this is Jakarta, massive gleaming city in Asia. 30 million people live there, and those 30 million people need water. And the water for that city comes from what's called a green belt. Um, it's called actually the, the, green, um, the, green, the green wall, is how they call it in Basha. But it's a green belt around the city that supplies water for the city. Now, that green belt has things like gibbons and clouded leopards, which is the reason why you or I might be attracted to that area. But for the citizen of Indonesia, it's a pretty good business case that you know, reforesting this, this forest around the city does provide people with employment, but more importantly, people with water for this growing metropolis. So finding ways to ally yourself with those centers of human concentration um, can make sense. The third point I want to make is about local communities. I've always believed that at the end of the day, the best protectors of, conserva of nature are people who are living closest to it. And it, it's something you have to embrace if you live in Montana. I live in a county uh, called Granite County. It has about 3,000 voters. I'm probably the only person in that county who drives a Prius. Um, my neighbor has you know, wolves with you know, the kill the wolf stickers on his truck. Um, and yet he's a neighbor to me, and when a tree falls in my driveway, he goes up there and cuts it and stacks it for me before I even know it. And people treat each other that way in that uh, situation, and he teases me a little bit for being a tree hugger, and I give him you know, equal measures politely um, uh, uh, about, about his, his sort of way. But at the end of the day, the guy has a deep abiding love for the land, and I think that really matters. This is the Great Bear Rainforest, all that white stuff you're seeing coming off that island is actually spawn from herring eggs. Um, this is an area that the Nature Conservancy worked in for a long, long time. It's 20 million plus acres of, of coastal rainforest um, in British Columbia. And, um, and of course, bears and salmon and all of that. But the story I wanted to quickly tell you is about uh, the Heltsuk people and how they harvest uh, herring. They, they have this amazing system for harvesting herring. They go out and cut spruce trees down, small trees, and then they take it into particular bays that the herring have traditionally spawned in, and then they sink the trees in the water. And then they come back a few days later, this is at the height of the full moon, and then they haul, haul, haul up the, uh, these herring uh, these these um, spruce branches. So this is a branch that we're pulling out. It probably weighs over 100 pounds, and it's just loaded and loaded and loaded with roe that the herring have deposited on on these uh, on these branches. It's an incredibly sustainable way of harvesting. The commercial way of fishing in this area, by the way, is just to catch the herring, slit the belly, squeeze out the eggs, and chuck the fish either back into the sea dead or for cat food, and you grind it up. Right? And, and you can just sort of see what kind of indigenous knowledge goes into figuring out what bay, what time, what tree type, and, and you know, how to harvest this in a clearly sustainable way. The Heltsuk are incredibly strong proponents of conservation, and getting them on our side um, makes a lot of sense. And it not only makes a lot of sense, but once we are gone, conservation still can continue because there's a local voice for it. And I think having that local voice is terribly important um, to how you message the work we do. Um, the fourth point I want to make is that land use can actually, at times, restore nature. And that's a sort of a cool concept to be able to play with because it, it doesn't say to people, you can't use this area. It actually sort of messages in a slightly different way and says, if you use it in a particular way, you can actually continue to keep the land in a certain way or you can continue to improve it in a certain way. So this is a guy named Alan Savory. Uh, many of you probably heard about it. He's really big into holistic 
uh, grazing practices. You know, Alan really believes um, that, you know, once upon a time, lots of parts of the world were covered by very large numbers of grazing animals. And these animals churned up the soil, they added nutrients, they helped plants, particularly grasses and grass species, grow and uh, diversify. And the removal of those herbivores has created the problems we see today. And that if you could graze, in a system similar to what would have been historically in this area, and in very simple terms, he talks about high densities for short amount of time and then moving on, you can actually restore the land. Now, this is one of his ranches in, in Zimbabwe. That's actually a, an, an orphaned elephant that now follows him around. It's really hard to have an argument with a guy who has an elephant that literally follows him around. Um, but he, he has cows, and you know he showed me around his, his ranch, and it's extraordinary the amount of wildlife that you see at his ranch in Zimbabwe, but also watercourses that look like this. These, this is a spring that seven years ago, he claims, did not have any water running in it at all, but because of his grazing practices, have really restored this land. Now, this is obviously something that we use in the United States as well, in Montana, where I live. Um, the Nature Conservancy works in a in an area called the Centennial Valley. It's probably the most beautiful place in Montana that I've ever been to. It's a, a one valley over from, um, from Yellowstone. And, you know, the ranches there, many of them practice a form of management that keeps the land open, that, um, that, that encourages rare species of beetles and rare species of plants and birds um, and still have some use for the land. Better still, they can then market the cattle that come out of this land for a premium. So if you go and buy Yellowstone grass-fed beef, you're paying an extra amount for this grass-fed beef that is grown in a sort of predator-friendly, organic, quote-unquote, way, and supporting ranchers on the ground whose, whose mission is to keep the land open for their way of life. It's more labor-intensive for sure, but it really has this role of, of um, restoring the landscape. And so land use as, a, as an idea for restoration, and land use as, a, as an idea for conservation is really interesting. I was just in South Africa with, the conserva with Conservation International, my organization, and I heard our manager for South Africa talk about how she sees conservation as a land use. So when she lists land uses, when she's doing you know, public forums or dealing with landowners, she, she actually lists conservation as a land use. It's not like you have all these different ways of using the land and then you have conservation, because for her, she sees it as uh, an activity that can derive economic value or value added for whatever you're going to do in that, in that area. And then the last thing is I wanted to bring you back to my pandas, of course. Um, this is how I started. I, I, I sort of hated pandas for many, many years. And uh, <laughs> probably the only guy who could hate pandas. And then a few years, uh, two, two years ago, I got this chance uh, for this PBS series, Earth and New Wild, to go to China and to film with pandas. And I really thought, boy, this is, I, you know, it's sort of so cliched, right? I mean, if you're going to do conservation, really cliched trying to do some story on pandas. Like, what, what could it be? So I go there, and they put 14 baby pandas in front of me, including that one on the right, who actually I think is dead, because it never moved. You can watch this video. It's like two minutes of video. That one panda doesn't ever, ever, ever move. Um, but, you know, so they put me in front of these pandas. They actually say to me, when President Obama is here, we give him two pandas. For you, 14. I'm like, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> and you know what? They do sort of melt your heart. You kind of get why you know, World Wildlife Fund was so brilliant about picking it as a logo. It really is an astonishingly special animal. And all the stuff you've heard about, about how they're bad at breeding and how they're sort of, you know, this evolutionary dead end, all of that stuff is just rubbish. They're an incredible, incredible animal. Incredible parental care, you know, incredible habits, incredible ways of life. I mean, it just, they melt your heart. There's really something about pandas. By the way, they're also kind of dangerous, um, just so you know. It's like, I didn't know this, but the most dangerous animal in a zoo is the elephant, which you can imagine. But the number two where keepers get injured is actually pandas, which is an incredible thing, given how few pandas there are in zoos. But I think people forget that they're a panda bear. You know, like, they, they focus on the panda. They don't forget, focus on the bear side of the equation. Um, but the reason I did this story and why I'm bringing it here um, 
is because what the Chinese are now doing with pandas is actually kind of amazing. So the Chinese are on this quest to actually rewild the panda. They've cracked the code on how to breed it. They're doing really great in breeding pandas. And we all sort of know that story. But what was astonishing to me was they were putting pandas back into the wild. Now these are captive born baby pandas that they're managing to rewild. For me, that was a huge story, right? I mean, here's a country with 1.1 billion people. And think about the pressures that you're under if you are a manager of a natural area in, in China and you're trying to protect a forest um, or a stand and you are contemplating actually bringing something like the panda back. So it's just it's incredible that they're actually being able to pull this off. So while I was there, so the reason why this guy is dressed up as a panda um, is because he doesn't want that other panda to know that he's a human, right? So the, the trick with these rewilding pandas is that you have to take the babies. This is the mom, but the baby's there somewhere. And the baby really can't really see a human. And the baby also has to be put through a battery of sort of tests. And they literally have 10 tests that the baby has to like uh, graduate from over a two-year training period, which they watch it with CC closed circuit tel television day and night. And only Chinese could do this, but they have done it. And you know, they teach that that baby to do everything from from climb trees to find the best bamboo to even running away from predators like snow leopards or bears. So they use skins of of animals to sort of. Um, you know, create fear into this, into this little baby. And over time, they get into bigger and bigger enclosures until it basically is in a 25-hectare enclosure. It rarely even sees his mother at about two years of age. And then when they really think it's ready, um, you know, in a pretty big... Oh, that's sorry. That's another baby panda. I just throw baby panda pictures in because... <laughs> when it's ready, they go out and release it. And this was the first female panda, captive born, to be released in China. This was two years ago, and she's still doing fine. She's out in the wild in the area where there are 13 other wild pandas. She has a radio collar on. They'll be catching her sometime now to re -put a, uh, sort of redo her collar. And this November, they're actually releasing um, another set of pandas, actually not just one, but several. Um, following in the footsteps of this sort of pioneering program. Just so you know, the, the first few releases were, were failures, right? So pandas were killed by other male pandas, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they went through, the, the program almost got shut down because it's under so much scrutiny. And, um, but the guy who does it, this guy named director Zhang Himen, an amazing guy, people call him Papa Panda, really persevered. If you met him, if he was here, he would fit right into this audience because he had this sort of amazing belief that you could take something that was kind of a niche and really, really do something remarkable with it. And he's really pulling it off. So I sort of wanted to close with, with, with that, uh, sort of saying that rewilding is still possible. It is possible even in the toughest of circumstances with the hardest of animals and the hardest of places to work in. And if they can do it there, imagine the potential we have you know, in America with the, the, the space we have, with the wealth we have, with the technology we have. It re really is possible. The last thing I want to do is, um, show you this picture of this old guy and um, if anyone knows who he is you can yell it out now but it, it, it isn't the, the, the there's a guy who looked like him in one of the slides that I saw previously but anyone know who this is? You wouldn't know, no way. It's President Garfield. <laughs> He's the 20th President of the United States but you know he is so underestimated by historians that he doesn't even make the list of like presidents with accomplishments. Um, but he actually was kind of an amazing guy. He was at, at, at the time of the country, the, you know, the country was really thinking about reconstruction. This was just after the Civil War. And they needed a president who could really think that through and really push forward with, with reconstruction and, and really give um, freed slaves, freedmen, um, the opportunities that they deserved. And he was willing to do it. He came out of the Republican Party. He was the only guy from the House uh, to ever sit in the seat of the presidency. He was a very reluctant president. He didn't really want the job um, compared to our lot now. Um, <laughs> and, and, and he only lasted 200 days because he was shot in an office. Now, it's worth reading about this guy's life, but the thing that I wanted to talk here about to, to you all is, is, is what happens when he got shot. So he gets shot in a station um, on his way to, to New York from DC. So he's lying there in a train station 
and um, Dr. You know, he's, he, his aide, by the way, this is an interesting thing, his aide was actually Lincoln's son, so his aide de camp which is sort of an unfortunate thing for this poor kid because this kid was the only person to have witnessed three American presidents getting shot, right? So he had his dad killed, then he had Garfield killed, and then he was there at the side of McKinley when McKinley gets shot as well. So you can just sort of imagine the burden that he had. Um, but so, so um, you know, Lincoln's son is there. I think his name was Todd, but I'm not sure. But anyway, he was there, and he was looking for a doctor, and, and he, he yells out for a doctor, and this young doctor in military uniform comes over and um, says, don't touch Garfield. Let's take a look at the wound, but don't touch him. Don't touch the wound. Let's move him to a clean area. And just as he's sort of getting into this, another doctor who happened to be in the station at the time, recognizing Lincoln's son, comes over. And that doctor was the guy who treated Lincoln himself. And believe it or not, this guy's name was Doctor. Like, as in Doctor, Doctor. Like, <laughs> you can't make this up. His name was Doctor, and it, it, it's a, his name was actually Doctor Bliss. That was his real name. So Doctor, Doctor Bliss comes over, long white beard, he used to wear a lab coat that was so covered in blood that blood, you know, it, would, it was black and it would flake off, right, um, as a sign of how many surgeries he had done, right? And the first thing he does is he grabs Garfield and he probes the wound with his finger, long fingernails in the railroad station, trying to find the bullet with his finger right there. Needless to say, long story short, they probe his finger, we have to probe him for many, many days, and, you know, um, I think... 70, 80 days later, he dies. When he dies, he dies of this massive infection. It turns out that the bullet really didn't do any real damage. It had scarred up, it had bounced off a rib, and it would have been fine. He would have lived without any, any treatment at all. But the treatments the doctors under Dr. Dr. Bliss's care was offering him was trying to find the bullet. And so they would do this ever-ending, very painful procedure. That when the guy died, they pulled out a pint and a half of pus from his body. He died of an infection. Now why this is interesting is that the young guy who first came to him uh, in a military uniform and said don't touch him and let's move him to a clean place was a young doctor who had studied in Europe and he had studied under a guy named Lister. The guy you know who had come up with this method called the antiseptic method and that you would have to wash your hands with carbolic soap and all of that and never never probe the wound and never probe it with your uh, bare hands. Now Lister's method was being used in Europe, but in America it was still not in vogue. It was still very, very, cut, I wouldn't say cutting edge, it was still thought of as, as European. Um, because who would believe that there are these tiny little things that are floating out there everywhere that could kill you, right? I mean it was just a pretty incredible proposition. And if this had happened 10 years later, the antiseptic method would have come to America and we would all, you know, Garfield would have lived. The reconstruction would never have been uh, as slow as it really was. And you would have had a pretty different trajectory for, for this country. And particularly, I would, I would, I would argue, for the South. Um, and maybe also for the Republican Party. Um, so it really had this momentous thing. Now, what's interesting about this whole thing is that the young guy who said, don't touch him, the guy who studied under the Lister, was black, and he was the first black surgeon in the Union Army. And it, it, it doesn't escape me that, you know, had he been of uh, a different persuasion and a different look and had a long white beard and had a lab coat, um, he, his method might have got through and Garfield would have been saved. Now, I, why I say this is because I really believe that one of the biggest challenges we have in conservation is whom our messengers are. And why I'm so excited that you've got 45 students here in this audience is exactly for that reason. So the message and the messenger are both important. We oftentimes place a lot of emphasis on the message, as we should, but we pay almost no, in, no attention to the messenger. And the messenger, I think, and, and I really believe, is as important, frankly, if not more, than the message itself. So whom you speak with, how you speak to them, what kind of messengers you use to get your message out is also really, really crucial to um, where we go with, uh, with conservation. So that's what I had to sort of tell you a little bit about, you know, how we 
think about nature. I think reframing this idea to ask, can nature save us, makes it a much more populist movement. It makes it something that every American, every person on the planet immediately has a stake in. I think companies will act in their self-interest. If you can tap into that, you're in good stead. I think cities and communities are natural places of concentration of need. And when you can define need, you can often link it then back to nature. I think land use, as opposed to just land preservation, can be an ally in certain cases, and we should, we, should, we should use that. I think local communities at the end of the day, when the dollars from philanthropy are gone, are the ones who will stand up and defend something. They might not use the words we use, they might not even call it conservation, but they ultimately care a lot about what's in their backyard, and I think if you can get them on your side, all the better for it. It's actually the secret in some ways of the Nature Conservancy's decentralized structure that is really hard to beat, that everyone is local and global at the same time. Um, rewilding is possible, even in the hardest of cases, and it's always amazing to me to, to sort of bring an example from China that has some positive relevance to the, to the rest of the world. And then lastly, um, the message and the messenger. Think really hard about who your messengers are. Who are the people who are selling your idea? Who are the people who are out there meeting your communities? Um, pay a lot of attention to that. I really, really, really believe it's, it's, it's really important. Look, if Sarah Palin had done a movie about oceans, say, and let's say it's a good movie, how many of our friends would have really gone out and seen it? And then we ask ourselves, well, why did... Um, so some of us would, but I think it, you ought, automatically have a high bar to carry. And then we then wonder why inconvenient truth is, is um, so difficult for half this country to, to deal with. It isn't because the message is wrong. It's really because the messenger is already, it already brings something to the table that people just don't want to hear. Simply it's because it's coming from, from someone um, as intelligent as Al Gore is, but it's clearly um, as political as he is as well. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to end by showing you a two-minute film. So, you know, um, Scott talked a bit about how even the Nature Conservancy, with the incredible network of a million members, um, has only about three or four percent sort of identification. My organized Conservation International, we don't even really have memberships in the UN, United States, outside of Hawaii. All our work is in faraway places like Madagascar and Suriname and Liberia, you know, and Brazil. So making people understand what we care about is really important. And one thing we did is we, we created a campaign last year, last October, called um, People Need Nature. And it really is that simple, and it's that simple premise, that nature will be fine, somehow it'll get along, but it's us humans who are really, really in trouble. It's a bit jarring, not everyone likes it, and I'm f perfectly fine with that, but it definitely got people's attention. Since we released a series of films narrated by everyone from Harrison Ford to Penelope Cruz and Kevin Spacey and Edward Norton, so one film is called Soil, one's called Rainforest, one's called Ocean, um, one's called Sky, one's called Mountain, so on and so forth. Um, we've got about two billion impressions and we don't have any money for paid advertising or anything like that, so we rely on friends. But I wanted to just show you one film that I personally really like. It's called Mother Nature. Um, it's got about 25 million views out there, so it definitely has caught people's attention. And it's narrated by Julia Roberts, uh, who reminds us that at the end of the na day, nature's been around for a really long time, and it's us humans who are really um, in peril. With that, thank you so much. Some call me nature. Others call me mother nature. I've been here for over four and a half billion years. 22,500 times longer than you. I don't really need people, but people need me. Yes, your future depends on me. When I thrive, you thrive. When I falter, you falter. Or worse. But I've been here for eons. I have fed species greater than you, 
and I have starved species greater than you. My oceans, my soil, my flowing streams, my forests, they all can take you or leave you. How you choose to live each day, whether you regard or disregard me, doesn't really matter to me. One way or the other, your actions will determine your fate, not mine. I am nature. I will go on. I am prepared to evolve. Are you? So, thank you. I just wanted to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Again, you know, you guys are on the front lines of conservation, so hats off to the work you do. And uh, if I get a chance, I'd love to go and see um, some of the few natural areas in Arkansas. I've got to make a trip back. I um, really want to thank Scott Simon and the Nature Conservancy in Arkansas for inviting me here. Um, and also all of you um, at the Natural Areas Association for giving me the chance. Just also want to give a shout out to my colleague and friend, Reed Noss. He, I've known Reed really since I was in grad school, and he's a major defender of conservation and a huge influence in, um, you know, in the thinking that's gone into so many organizations and their work that they do um, in saving, saving the planet for all of us. Thank you again.